Welcome to UNC Coastal Studies Institute um, and this month's edition of our Science on the Sound program. Um, for our online audience, um, we're having some trouble with our website live chat. So if you have any questions, um, you'll have to go to our Facebook live feed. And for you guys here, please try to hold your questions until the end because we'll, we'll have a microphone passed around and we'll, we'll do that then. So anyway, the program tonight, and well, I'm Jeff Lewis if I didn't tell you, I'm the horticultural specialist here. Um, been here about two and a half years. My goal is to um, beautify the campus using native plants only and while creating and enhancing and protecting wildlife habitat. So I've got my hands full. All right, so our topic tonight is sustainable gardening. This would include vegetable gardening or perennial beds, pollinator gardens, just whatever kind of gardening you like to do or want to do, whatever you want to create. You can do it more sustainably or less sustainably. So, um, sustainable, sustain. Sustain means to keep going, perpetuate existence. Sounds like a good thing, doesn't it? Um, to conserve an ecological balance by avoiding depletion of natural resources. We're basically looking after Mother Earth here and trying to put something back, give something back to the environment because you know humans are bad about taking from the environment. Um, so sustainable gardening sustains the soil and the plants. It conserves resources. It nurtures the plant around us, nourishing and sustaining our families as well as the wildlife around us. Um, the benefits of sustainable gardening, um, definitely good for the environment. Um, sustainable gardening requires no chemical fertilizers, no herbicides or pesticides, and it conserves water, protects water quality, improves the soil, and increases wildlife numbers and diversity. You can't beat that. It also saves money for those same reasons. Those things are expensive. It also, if, you, if you're into vegetable gardening, also is, it provides a way to grow some good, healthy, organic food. I'm not an expert on vegetable gardening. I did that last about 30 years ago in Raleigh, other than a tomato or two. So you'll have to realize I'm not an expert on vegetable gardening. Um, it's also good for your physical health and mental health. Physical health, of course, is obvious. You're out there working and building up a sweat, getting a little cardiovascular workout sometimes. And it's good for your mental health. It's good to get out in the fresh air and unwind and release your problems. Um, you know, weeding, for, for instance, I've said for years and years that weeding is very therapeutic. So it's good for your mental health too. Um, improves your learning. Studies have shown that getting outside helps improve your learning and your concentration. <clears throat> okay, these are the topics I'm gonna to touch on tonight, probably some more than others. I'm certainly not gonna get into garden design as far as this goes here and this goes there. I mean, that would be a whole nother course, but we'll, we'll, we'll touch on each of these subjects. Okay, here's some design and planting tips. Well, as you probably know, spring and fall are best for most planting. And around here, as long as the ground hasn't frozen solid, you actually can plant in the winter too. Um, what you want to do when you plant is start, and when you plan and plant, you want to start with your largest items first. Um, you want to decide where your trees are gonna go before you decide where your Perennials are going to go. It's a lot easier to move those perennials later than it is to go back and move a tree. So start with your trees, go to your shrubs, then your perennials, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And obviously your sun-loving plants you want to place in the areas of full sun, away from the shadows of buildings and other structures. And then your shade-loving plants can go in the shade, go in the shadow of of those plants or structures. And then there's all kinds of in-between plants, um, some that like a little bit of afternoon shade, so you can plant accordingly. Um, you may need, on the outer banks, I know I certainly need, them out, need it out here, you may need a windscreen. A lot of times, um, 
plants just get blown away out here. Not literally, almost literally. But I mean, out here, that's my biggest challenge. It's, it's the first time I've gardened in full sun with this much wind. I mean, I can't even mulch my beds. It blows away. So a windscreen can be very important. I can't really put a windscreen here to block the campus. I can, you know, I can put small windscreens, plant downwind of big shrubs and things. <clears throat> and, you know, windscreens would be shrubs that grow fast. Um, maybe wax myrtles, or if you get away from natives, you can, there are things like pittosporums that would work, but I'm gonna try to stick with natives here. That's where I think a lot of the Japanese black pines were actually planted on the outer banks as temporary plantings to, to block the wind. And plants obviously that need the most, need moist soil can be placed in low areas or at least near water sources. You know, out here, we have a lot of dry habitat, and then we have some really wet areas around the water retention ponds. And so it's around the edges of those where I'll plant my water, my moisture-loving plants. Um, like I said, it's, it's, it's good, it's important to mulch beds to retain moisture, keep you from having to water so much, help keep down the weeds, and, uh, pre and to prevent topsoil loss from wind. <laughs> And uh, ground covers can also help in that, in that regard. They can help the soils hold water and prevent topsoil from washing or blowing away. And also, if you have a slope, um, ground covers can be good to, to um, cover the slope to prevent erosion. If growing vegetables, um, companion planting may be helpful to you. Um, I don't know a lot about companion planting. I've always heard about planting marigolds next to vegetables to keep the pest away. And I've got a website on the table back there. I've got several websites. If you see a website on here or hear me talking about reading something off a website, I've got, I've got them written down on a piece of paper back there. You can copy it. I'm doing this sustainably. I've only made one copy. So you can take out your phone and take a picture of them. But there are a lot of good combinations. Um, companion plants, um, some plants actually make the other plants taste better if you grow them next to each other, supposedly. <clears throat> um, you can use green cover crops. I think of this as more with vegetables. Actually, I think about it as with, with farms, but um, you know, big, big time farmers use green cover crops, alfalfa and wheat and things like that. But you can also do that on a small scale with annual ryegrass and maybe some other plants to cover bare areas in the winter. And then in the spring, you have to, at some point, you have to turn them, in, turn them under but that can help you um, reduce erosion and improve soil fertility. And even if you're planting an edible garden, please leave room for plants that, that um, attract beneficial insects because they'll help your garden. Okay, if possible, it depends on your yard size, depends on a lot of things, but if possible, um, plan to include a rain garden. Um, we have bioretention ponds out here, which, which um, or pictured here, they're wet when it rains for a day or two, and then, and then they dry up. You know, the soil, I mean the water, you know, drains down, is absorbed, is filtered. And, and why is that important to catch that rainwater? I mean, back in, the, back in the old days, what you did when you had a piece of property, you put in ditches. You wanted to drain everything away when it rained. And that was a disaster in this country. That pollutes all our waterways, all the pesticides and and um, fertilizers and things just, and sediments just run right into the waterways. So <clears throat> what you should do is um, analyze your yard, see where the slopes, see where the rain runs, and see where you have downspouts from your gutters and all that kind of stuff, and try to, you try to trap that rainwater and keep it from running into the waterways. You can see on the bottom, you know, there's a, there's a drain here that's just getting flooded by rain, and over here is a little ditch or gully beside a road that's just filled with rain with stormwater runoff. And that is a big problem. And we're right here where you can see it firsthand. Um, also, you would want to use, if you can, um, porous landscaping materials for the, you know, for the same reason. The why is obvious. 
this lets at least some of the rainwater into the ground, lets it be absorbed so it doesn't run off. If you have a solid driveway sloped down to the road, you, you see what happens when it rains. If you have a permeable, um, a porous material there, then, then it helps a lot. You know, out here we've got some solid paving and we also have some gravel parking lots. And you know, this is just the shot here of the campus just to, so you can imagine all the pollutants running into the water and killing the fish and causing algae blooms and that kind of thing. And you also can um, use natural or environmentally friendly building materials or recycled materials. You can build compost bins out of old pallets. You can use you know, natural stones for walkways instead of concrete. And then you, there are recycled products available also. Um, you may want to do this first. Pay attention to erosion prone areas and fix these problems. I've had to do some of this out here. If you have a slope, it's, um, it's not unlikely that you're having some erosion. Okay, basic plant selection. I've already mentioned native plants, but to be, it's easier to have a sustainable garden if you use as many native plants as possible because they're the ones that are native and work, in, work best in our, your um, climate, your habitat. Um, it does, you do have to take into consideration your local conditions when you decide on plants to plant. Um, you know, you may be in a sunny spot or shady spot. You may be in a windy area or not. If you're in a windy area, do you get the ocean spray or, or are you protected and only get wind from the sound? There are a lot of variables here. Um, your soil, your soil may be naturally moist. You may have a good texture or poor texture. It may be fertile already. Um, I certainly recommend sending off soil samples. And I've got some on the table, some handouts back there. I've got some soil sample boxes and the forms. If you want to pick one up on the way out, you may. <clears throat> as far as plant lists, there are just numerous native plant lists on the, on, on the internet, including on our website. So you can go on our website and look at those too. Okay, why natives? I think we've already covered some of this. Better, better for the ecosystem. They support the local fauna, including wildlife, from bees to bird, microorganisms to moose. No, not moose, to monarchs. I like to say bees to bears and microorganisms to moose. Okay, how about to mice? They are easier to grow. Natives are easier to grow with less maintenance and water required. Now, keep in mind, if you're planting native water lilies, they do require a lot of water. That's a whole different thing there. Um, they require basically no chemical fertilizers or pesticides, and so they're less costly to grow. In fact, a lot of native plants don't even like real, real fertile soil. I mean, a lot of them, you know, they've, think about our native plants in this area, the soil they're living in, the soil they've, they're, they're growing in and have been for a thousand years. It's not real fertile most of the time. It's sandy, it doesn't hold a lot of fertility. So that's what they've adapted to, and that's what they want. Fertile soil could actually cause problems with them. And, um, you know, please avoid, I mean, I understand having some, having some non-native plants in your, in your garden. I mean, I love hollyhocks. I'll always have hollyhocks. But try to avoid the ones that are very aggressive, that either seed everywhere or like the wisteria in my yard just takes over, climbs up into every tree. There are some really bad invasive plants out here. English ivy is, is a terribly invasive plant. The Russian olives are awful too. <clears throat> and you know, the nat native plants will attract wildlife a lot better than, than the invasives too, than the exotics too. Even though birds, for instance, may eat Russian olive olives, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a good plant for wildlife. It doesn't even mean it's necessarily a good plant for birds. Who knows if, if, who knows if cedar wax wings are better off physiologically eating 
rust knobs than they, than they would be eating their, you know, like Yopon holly berries. Who knows what it's doing to their bodies long term. Could be like American food. <clears throat> okay, food crops. <clears throat> if growing plants for food, um, choose those, you know, for best results and be more sustainable and use less water and less fertilizer and all that stuff. Choose those that will thrive in your area and climate without the need for pesticides and excessive water. Um, you, may, you may be able to read to, to find out what those particular vegetables are. You may be able to look at your neighbors, see what they're growing successfully. Um, and then depending on your location, a screen from the wind may, may be needed. I've said that before. Um, compost helps tremendously. Um, our sandy soil does not hold nutrients very well or water. And um, uh, you, may, you may also want to consider companion planting. I mentioned that already. One thing about um, compost with food crops, well, I think I'm, I'm going to get into that in a minute. But anyway, you don't have to worry so much about pH. The compost just makes the soil right. A partial list of vegetables that perform well in the Outer Banks include kale, lettuce, spinach, Swiss chard, cabbage, collards, broccoli, tomatoes, on and on and on and on. When I started looking that up, everything was listed just about. If you, if you look at, there's a certain restaurant on the causeway here that grows their own vegetables, and they're right on the sound. They're 20 feet from the sound, and they grow beautiful leaf, leafy vegetables. So it really, we're, we're lucky to have... Um, even though the soil doesn't hold nutrients well, at least it's easy to dig in and has good, it's well drained, so we don't have to worry too, too, too much about plants rotting. Um, herbs do very well here. I have grown herbs for many years on the Outer Banks. Most of them prefer well drained soils. And if you've, been, if you've been around the Outer Banks very much, you'll see that rosemary grows like crazy around here. It's almost like ornamental shrubs in people's yards. So there are some plants that are better than others for this climate. Um, there are also some fruits that perform well here. I mean, blueberries are native, so they do great here. Um, provide blueberries, of course. They have spring flowers, and they have good fall color. Um, figs do well. Take a lot of room, but they do well. Uh, muscadine grapes are famous on this island here. And loquats do well here, too. And you may be able to get more information from our local um, ag extension office here in Mantia. I'm sure they have pamphlets and things about this. As far as watering, um, install a rain gauge and only water when needed. Um, water early or late in the day. At least water, if you water late in the day, you still want to water early enough for the foliage to have a chance to dry before dark. Um, use drip or soaker hoses instead of sprinklers. Um, try to prevent water runoff onto streets or into storm gutters or ditches. You know, divert your rainwater from gutters and downspouts. You can, um, there's a couple, couple of photos of that here. You can put a bed of gravel and lead it to your lawn. Or you can, um, you know, just put a slab of concrete. But you don't want it to run down your driveway. Um, what's preferable, really, if you have gutters and downspouts, is to hook it to a... Um, Hook it to a rain barrel. Um, we, have, we have cisterns here. I forgot how many thousands of gallons of water they hold. We have cisterns here, here at CSI, which are like underground rain barrels, basically. And that's what I water with here. Um, but keep in mind that native plants in general do use less water than exotics. Okay, what about weed control? Well, first of all, you've got to define weed. You know, a weed is, what is it people say? A weed is a plant that's out of place, not in, not in its right place. Um, I certainly have a different idea of what a weed is probably for most of you all. Um, to me, out here, now only gardening with native plants. And you see, weeds are camellias and, and crepe myrtles and, <laughs> and these Japanese azaleas. So those are weeds to me. Uh, what about golden rod? Is golden rod a weed? A lot of people would say it is, and it can be. I mean, they've seeded in my garden, in my pollinator garden, to where I'm weeding out hundreds of them, if not thousands. So they can be weedy, but I don't consider them actually a weed. But as you learn about the nature around you 
and how it interacts with the plants, like, like the monarchs on the goldenrod, then um, you may change your thinking about what, it, what a weed is. <clears throat> and then secondly, learn to tolerate a certain level of weeds. And third, um, remove weeds mechanically to be sustainable. Try not to use herbicides. Um, so, you know, by hoe or hand is better. And like I said earlier, weeding is actually very therapeutic. You can come home from a hard day's work and go out and weed for half an hour and you'll feel a whole lot better, especially if you have a cold drink with you. Um, out here, I do use a few, I do, I do use a little bit of glyphosate, but I only use it on exotic plants that are really tough to get rid of. So um, I have tried this number four. I have tried the vinegar and soap combinations and they'll knock, I can't really vouch for them I'm, either way. I mean, they will knock plants down, but I'm not so sure how well they keep them down. There are also com combinations with salt. I haven't tried that yet. I just don't like the idea of putting salt into the environment. We've already, we're already salty enough as it is. I don't know what it would do to the soil if the salt would leach out quickly enough or not. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, you can Google all kinds of um, homemade recipes for earth-friendly <coughs> herbicides. But there's nothing beats a good old hand. Um, so, golden rods, you know, to me, they're beautiful, easy to grow perennials. They attract lots of pollinators. They're just gorgeous in the fall when you have big drifts of, of um, goldenrod. They're very salt tolerant. They can take flooding, drought. Um, and they're very important in the fall during fall migration for the monarch butterflies. And they also they have a bad, rip, bad rap um, about causing allergies, but they actually have a real heavy, sticky pollen, which doesn't blow in the wind. It has to be carried by insects, by pollinators. So they really are not an allergen plant. Um, you've probably heard this before, but ragweed blooms at the same time as, as goldenrod. And ragweed does blow everywhere. So that's probably the culprit, although there are lots of potential culprits out there. <clears throat> okay, insect control. First of all, learn to tolerate Minor insect damage. I mean, so what if there's a hole in a leaf? Um, two, don't freak out when you see bugs. I read that a whopping 97% of the insects found in our gardens are actually beneficial or benign at the, at the very least. You know, a lot of insects are actually predators that eat the bad insects. So, um, and discovering insects is fun. When you start trying to learn insects, get you a couple books, start trying to learn insects, um, it becomes fun then when you go out into the garden to, to try to identify new species of insects. Most people would start with butterflies, I'd say. That's the easiest, and there's lots of material on butterflies. But start, also start by learning which caterpillars become butterflies, and you can actually plant extra host plants just for them. I know I've, I've, um, one time a lady wanted some milkweed plants, so she could grow, have monarchs, but then she was devastated when the caterpillars were eating her milkweed plants. It's like, wait a minute now, those are the monarchs. <laughs> so don't freak out when things are eating your plants. It may be something you actually want, and you can always plant more just for them. Um, okay, remember that pesticides kill beneficial insects too. And if you kill, sometimes killing beneficial insects, like the predators, you know, may cause a population surge of the, of the, the pest, the sucking insects. Um, of course, pesticides also release harmful chemicals into the environment that can sicken other animals, anything, your dog, your cat, your family. Um, there are natural products on the market, um, organic insecticidal soap, neem oil, Bt, diatomaceous earth, and those are good for to, if you're going to target a certain pest. But remember that even these um, can kill beneficial insects. So it's better to, to hand pick the pest. Or a lot of times, if it's, if it's something like aphids, you can just blast them with water and it, it'll, you know, it'll take them six months to get back. So, <clears throat> um, And here again, companion planting 
It may help deter some pest in vegetable gardenings. Whoa, 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 what happened? What in the world? This calls for the use of a mouse. Oops, oops. I'm afraid to do current slide. Let me try it and see. Nope, that's not it. Is that where I was? Yep. Yeah. Okay, disease control. <clears throat> um, prevention is always good. The foundation of the health of a garden is the soil health. So this goes back to compost. If you use a lot of compost, that will improve your soil health. Um, there are some good gardening practices that can reduce, reduce disease problems. You can't always reduce every, can't always prevent every problem. Um, you sort of can with native plants, but I'm thinking of vegetable gardens. It's, sometimes it's hard to not have any diseases. <clears throat> of course, you can buy disease-resistant tomatoes and things like that. But anyway, number one, um, make, always make clean pruning cuts. Um, keep your gardening tools, especially your clippers and pruners, sharp and disinfected. You can keep a little bottle of rubbing alcohol with you to clean your tools. Um, remove sick plants or plant parts immediately. Don't let something sick spread around. Um, and, you know, be sure to water around the base of your plants. Don't, don't water the foliage. Overhead, ir overhead irrigation is not recommended. <clears throat> and you want to water early enough in the day for the foliage to dry out before dark. Help prevent fungus. And try to stay out of your garden when it's wet. You know, you can, you can brush against plants and, tr and transfer stuff from one plant to another. <clears throat> Um, we're at a disadvantage here in this humid area that we live, but, but good airflow always helps. So try not to place your plants too close to one another. And of course, monocultures are worse than having a diversity of plants too. That's, to me, I think of farmers in that regard more, but probably, probably wouldn't hurt in a home garden too. And there are organic sprays or drenches that can be made or purchased. And there are plant-based horticultural oils available as well. I'm afraid to touch this thing. Okay, composting. Um, everybody should be composting. I mean, you can put anything you rake up from the yard, leaves and small sticks, um, grass clippings, um, all your kitchen compost. I mean, here we have buckets in our break rooms where we, you know, we put our coffee filters with coffee and, and some paper and all our, all our food products, uh, meat's not real good, but you know, any kind of vegetables and fruits that's, that's left over can go in your compost. And compost, compost heaps can be any design you want to make them. I mean, they can be you know, wire baskets, wire screens. They can be pallets that are lashed together. Um, all I have right now at work is, is one of these passive compost heaps, just a big giant heap. And I try to turn it once a year with a tractor um, but you can you know you can buy them you can buy fancy ones that, that, that swivel and you can build them just let your imagination lead you but they're they're great they reduced it's also it's amazing if you haven't composted I remember the first time I did years and years and years ago it was amazing I kept piling piles of leaves and they went away piles of leaves they went away it really takes a lot of leaves to make a little bit of compost and, it, and it, of course, it attracts earthworms, which also help the soil. So you'll, you'll have a lot of earthworms in your compost. If you like to go fishing, you've got a lot of bait there. Um, but anyway, um, so, so composting means less material in your garbage, less material in the local landfill, attracts earthworms, improves your soil texture, it helps to neutralize the pH, it helps, um, helps your soil hold moisture, Helps prevent erosion to have that good compost on there. And it saves money by not having to purchase bag soil, you know, amendments or fertilizers. I mean, it's sort of, it's sort of amazing how what us humans have been brainwashed into doing. Um, we rake all our leaves off our yard. We put them in plastic bags that we have to buy, put them on the edge of the street to be picked up. 
Then we go to the then we go to the big box store and buy amendments to take back to our home in plastic bags, buy amendments and open them up and pour them back on our yard. It's like, what was wrong with the leaves? <laughs> so anyway. Okay. The brainwashing of America. A few words on lawns. Um, lawns are probably the most unsustainable practice we have. Um, not to be confused with our native prairie ecosystem, lawns are basically ecological deserts. They support very little as far as species. I mean, you may see a robin hopping around on your lawn, but, but the robin would still rather it not be a manicured lawn. He'd still rather it be a, a mixed planting with native species, but they support virtually nothing, especially when we, when we poison them like we do. They require constant attention or, and are very expensive to maintain. Lawns are prone to diseases, and they're also, they also are an invitation for invasive species because of all the fertilizer. The fertilizer and pesticide runoff, which is money down the drain, pollutes our waterways. At a time when we're beginning to realize shortages of clean drinking water, Lawns are the largest irrigated crop in this country, occupying over 45 million acres of land. On the East Coast, they account for 30% um, of our water use, and on the West Coast, 60%. Um, locally, you can drive the bypass in the early morning on a rainy day and get hit in the windshield with someone's sprinkler. So, I mean, we're just not very smart about that. Um, so how many hours do we spend tending to our grass? Lots. And what about the huge amounts of gasoline that our mowers, trimmers, edgers, et cetera, use? Um, I read on, on the internet, which means it's gotta be true. 600 million gallons per year in this country of gas we're using on our lawns. And that doesn't mention, that doesn't even count the spillage, which is the next paragraph. Um, more gas is spilled each year in the filling of lawn equipment than was lost in the entire Exxon Valdez oil spill. You know, this gasoline, you know, it, it kills the plants, it seeps into the soil, it runs off during storms, runs into our waterways. You know, it, it, just, it's just a killer. Um, contributes to pollution and kills fish and other wildlife. And, I, you know, I mean, I, I understand, I sort of understand, I understand less and less the older I get, but I mean, I know that lawns are attractive, and I know they're a great place to play, throw frisbee if, you, if you're a kid, they're a good place to sit out and have your, your tea in the evening, um, have company over. And I know I'm not going to, I know everybody's not going to go home and destroy their lawns. Does anybody here not have a lawn at all? All right, all right. Um, but, but what I'm hoping to convince you to do is to downsize it. Um, you can reduce your lawn size and replace a portion of it with whatever you like. Um, native perennials, you know, pollinator garden, um, ground cover, shrubs and trees. Um, you know, you can, you can make a flowering meadow out of it. A meadow sure beats a lawn or even a vegetable garden. Now I realize some people, hopefully no one in this, in this room, but I know some people, like one of my brothers, lives in a certain neighborhood where they have certain rules and you can't just do that. But anyway, hopefully that'll, hopefully we'll wise up one of these days. Um, but smaller lawns are also easier to keep looking nice. You know, if you have a lawn this big, if you have a 20 by 20 lawn, you can keep it darn near pretty immaculate and use a whole lot less fertilizer, a whole lot less water, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So think about it that way. I mean, look at some of these pictures I gleaned off the internet. You know, you can, there's, there are all kinds of ways to have a little bit of lawn and have beautiful flower beds and meandering stone paths and just create a little, you know, um, hidden garden, not a hidden garden. What's the secret garden? There you go. And think of the time you'll save not having to mow grass. You'd be pulling weeds instead. Um, another possibility, I don't know a lot about this, but there are some native drought-tolerant grass species. Um, I, 
I've included, I've included a couple of websites which I've also got on paper back there so you don't have to try to jot these down. But um, when I started reading this, it was, it was pretty interesting. Um, there are some, some possibilities other than, you know, our, our Bermuda grass, including sedges. Anyway, you may want to, you may want to check into that, especially if, you, if, you're, if you're going to have that small, long, excuse me, um, other possibilities, other things you can do, you can switch to the old-fashioned real mowers that don't use gas. I know when I was a kid, we'd go visit my grandparents, and they had one in the back, and I couldn't wait to get it out and, and mow the grass just because it was, I just thought it was so cool to have a push mower to watch the thing whir around and throw the grass. So you can switch over to old-fashioned real mowers that don't use gas. Um, the ones today are a lot easier to push than the ones that I had to strain with when I was a kid. Plus, they're quiet. Can you imagine waking up on Saturday morning and not hearing a lawnmower in your neighborhood? If you're going to stick with your gas-powered mower, uh, be sure to keep it serviced and the blade sharp and try not to mow as often. If your mower is old, um, a newer model probably will be more efficient. So that's something to consider too. Um, electric mowers and string trimmers are an option too, especially if you have a small lawn. If you have small patches of lawn, you can just have an electric string trimmer and take care of it. <clears throat> and uh, don't overwater your lawns. It goes back to the rain gauge. Um, lawns need about an inch of rain, of water per week. It's better for them to have, you know, one heavy watering per week than to sprinkle them all the time. The roots grow deeper and, it can, and they tolerate drought better that way. Um, if you're using an irrigation system, um, learn how to shut it off manually during times of wet weather. And also adjust, adjust your sprinkler heads or nozzles so that you're not watering the street. Like I said about driving along the causeway. And in the winter, you can I'll see sheets of ice sometimes out there where the sprinklers are hitting. <clears throat> okay, before fertilizing, get your soil tested. It's simple to do and free most of the year, excluding shipping. It's, it's free now, though, from now through November. And like I said earlier, I do have some uh, free containers and forms on the back table there. It seems to be standard practice, at least where I've lived, people just automatically throw lime and throw fertilizer on their lawns every year without checking anything. And they throw their pre-emergent and their post-emergent and their... And their, and their um, Weed and feed, because this is making those big corporations so happy. Um, test the soil. Test the soil. Um, and over-fertilizing can also cause excess growth, which makes your lawn more susceptible to disease. The phosphorus in fertilizer, the middle number, which, which is a big polluter, has, has been removed from a lot of fertilizers now, which is a good thing. And organic fertilizers are also available, and you know they're they're better, of course, for the environment. But that doesn't mean they can't wash, they can't pollute the waters by nutrients washing into the waters. Um, okay, um, I know I'm, I'm beating this to death. Anyway, we've been brainwashed into thinking we had to have the most immaculate lawn possible. I mean, is it really that important to keep up with the Joneses? Um, learn to tolerate a few weeds and bugs. Um, chemical companies try to hide this. I mean, it's on the bottles, but it's really small print. But you've got to keep in mind that all these pesticides, you know, which pesticides are for, or for animals and, for, and include herbicides for, for um, weeds, all these pesticides are nothing but poisons. They are poisons, poisons. They, they poison our pets. They poison our children. They poison nature. That's why they work. They kill everything. It's not, they're not a good thing. So here are a few malis, um, miscellaneous suggestions before I wrap this up. I had not rehearsed this, so I did not know how long it would last. Um, but um, seed saving is, is fun, and sometimes, depending on where you live, there may even be a seed saving group where you may be able to at least get with some neighbors, fellow gardeners, and exchange seeds. But you can, you can collect seeds and, um, 
you know, from, you can collect seeds from, from nature too, as long as you don't take too many. You don't want to find a patch of some plant and, and strip all the seeds. I think 10% might be the most you should ever take, something like that. Um, especially since native plants um, also are hard to find a lot of times. It's hard to source native plants. I mean, they have, there are, there, there are a few good sources around here, but it's one of the things I run into in trying to use only natives is I'll place my order in my head and then I'll start researching sources and, and they're not available. So I've resorted to having to grow some things myself. Um, crop rotation, nothing to do with crop circles. That's um, crop rotation is, is don't plant your tomatoes in the same spot every year, you know, change things around. That's, that's more with the, with the food, food crops. Um, vermiculture, um, great for the soil and fun for the kids. That's, that's growing earthworms. We talked about that earlier, about how good they are for your soil. Um, and try to re reuse and re recycle your plastic pots. I know some of the nurseries probably will be glad to have your plastic pots back. So don't throw them in the dumpster, please. Um, they're not as easy to reuse as they used to be. They used to be nice and sturdy plastic. Now they're really, really thin, which is a good thing. They're using less plastic, but still they can be reused. Um, um, and never use poisons outside, please. I mean, I've been talking about pesticides on your lawns, but I'm referring to rodenticides, please don't poison, please don't put poison outside for mice and rats and things. If you've heard of bioaccumulation, that's what the barn owl, dead barn owl picture's for. When you poison mice, you know, there's no telling how many you're poisoned. And while they're staggering around, they're just a prime candidate for a raptor, a hawk or an owl or something to take that creature. And so then, the hawk or the owl, or the dog or the cat, or the, or the coyote, bad choice. Um, um, you know, they, they, they'll eat that mouse, and then they, may, they may, eat, may eat another poison one the same day, or the next day, or the next week. Anyway, the poison builds up in that predator until it kills the predator too. So it's a bad idea to use poisons outside, or even to use them inside, if, if, if the poison animal can then run outside, it's the same difference. Um, and try not to mow. I look at our I look at our ditches around here, like between just this one right here on Highway 345. There are some really cool plants that will grow in these wet ditches that don't grow anywhere else because we've taken so much away from the environment. I know several years ago there were some beautiful white orchids right down the road here, and I stopped and took a few pictures and said I got to come back and get some better pictures. And I came back a day or two later and they had bush hogged the ditch. I mean, they didn't even mow the shoulder road, but they had bush hogged the whole ditch all the way down. I'm like, really? So anyway, um, I encourage you not to mow your ditch habitats any more than you have to. Maybe limit it to once a year. You know, you see these real pretty ditches that are just grassy swales. So, and you know, a lot of people think, well, snakes. Well, snakes. Snakes are part of nature. Snakes aren't bad. So anyway... Um, and I, I talked about this earlier. Learn how to in, identify insects. It's a lot of fun. And then you can help those bugs that are in trouble. You can, you can um, put the plants out there they like, and you can not kill them. Involve children in gardening. That's always a good thing to, enjoy, in, to involve children in any act or act, activity or anything to do with nature. Um, and join a garden club. That's, that can be a lot of fun. Okay. Thank you for attending this evening.